Hey guys, Turk here. I hope you're having a great day. God, man, we have covered a lot of ground when it comes to hardware reviews over the past eight months. We've covered some CPU reviews, some GPU prediction videos, and we've even covered a couple of different motherboard reviews along the way. But now that the dust has settled quite a bit, I think it's a great chance and opportunity to take a look at the GPU tier list from Turk's perspective. Now, I've got a, quite a few GPUs on hand, all the way from the low end tier, all the way to the top end tier, and I'm also going to be doing kind of a meta analysis when it comes to price, including both MSRP and eBay pricing. Now, we've got 12 games to look at today, so let's get straight to it. Now, a lot of the data you were about to see today, it really shouldn't come as a shock to you. If you've watched any of the reviews from Gamers Nexus or Hardware Unboxed, many of the graphics cards we've listed today have been well documented in terms of their performance as you go up the product stack. However, today I wanted to take a look at the tier list and I'm gonna be using a lot of influence from my good old friend Demon Mitt. Now he does a bunch of PC builds and posts their pictures to many of the different discords on there. So I'll post some links down below so you can check out his good work down there. But I'm also gonna be taking a lot of my influence from a German website called 3dcenter.org. Now they've been covering a lot of the GPU launches over the past year, but I find their content to be rather difficult to consume. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a good list of forward looking games that I have on my test bench and I'm going to put them against all the different GPUs that I have at my disposal. Now it has been quite a while since we've done a GPU tier list here on the channel and I've actually finally gotten a little bit of extra time on my hands to put all of my different cards through my test suite. Now, I don't have every single graphics card that's on the list today, but I do have a good representation of each of the different rungs of the hierarchy in order to give you guys a feel of what it looks like from a performance versus price perspective. For the low end, I've got quite a few different graphics cards like the RX 580 that I've actually had highlighted in my $600 budget PC build. Oh man, do y'all remember what a budget PC build was? Man, those were the good old days. Uh, so we've got the RX 580, it's gonna be an eight gigabyte variant. And the next different graphics card I've got is the GTX 1650 Super. Though it isn't as powerful as the AMD card, it does include the latest Turing encoder for all of you streamers out there. Now, lastly on the low end, I've got my RX 5500 XT. Now, it's only the four gigabyte variant. And as you'll see, as we go through some of these different charts today, four gigabytes and even six gigabytes it's really not going to cut it as we start to get into the more demanding and more future looking video games. Moving into the mid tier, we have what I believe is the best value card these days, and that is the GTX 1080. It has eight gigabytes of RAM and throws out some pretty good frame rates. So I think this is the card to get if you are on a budget. From Team Red though, we do have the 5600 XT. It shares a lot of the same performance as the GTX 1080, but it only has six gigabytes of RAM. Still, it's a pretty decent choice, but some games just don't run that well. Now, the beginnings of the mid-tier, I just haven't been able to get my hands on one of those cards, so I don't have a really good representation of the RTX 3060, the RX 5700 XT, or any of the RTX 2070 variants. I do, however, have my hands on an RTX 2080 Super, and it still has the horsepower to even run some games with impressive RTX ray tracing performance. Now, arguably the most interesting tier here is the high-end tier. Many of the offerings from both AMD and Nvidia hit this tier dead on. I've got the RTX 3070 and RTX 3080 at my disposal for testing. At the top of the stack, I do have some data for the RX 6900 XT, but I am unable to get some of the game's performance on this card. For our testing, I'm putting each GPU into my AMD test bench armed with the 5900X, the Noctua NHD 15 cooler, and 32 gigs of DDR4 3200 at CL16. Now, it's chart time. Start us off with Red Dead Redemption 2. So for the bottom end of the stack, we do see that the RX 580, it is starting to struggle, only managing to get 43 FPS, but none of the low tier graphics cards managed to get above 60 FPS, and that includes the GTX 1080. Now, going above the 5600 XT, which is kind of borderline mid-tier graphics cards, we do manage to get above 60 FPS in this graphically demanding title, but we also start to see some diminishing returns as we get to the RTX 3080 and higher. Going into 1440p, however, we do see that all of the different low, low tier and some of the mid-range tier graphics cards, they only manage to get right at about 40 FPS. Now, the RTX 2080 Super and higher do manage to get 
uh, above 60 FPS in this particular title. Now let's take a look at Shadow of the Tomb Raider. Again, we start to see that each of the budget tiers here start to show some uh, stair-stepping as we go up the stack. And fortunately for us, all of the different graphics cards here get above 60 FPS. Now the RX 5500 XT, it's the bottom spot here, but it's not that much further below the 1650 Super. And the 5600 XT manages to swing a little bit faster than the GTX 1080. As you get up to the upper mid tier and higher, you do see some linear scaling with the RTX 2080 Super almost at 160 FPS and it scales upward from there. So for Shadow of the Tomb Raider at 1440p, you will need a GTX 1080 or higher in order to get the 60 FPS threshold. Now do keep in mind that this is being tested with the 5900X and as we saw with some of the Ryzen 5000 series launch material, this game can be pretty CPU limited at times, so keep that in mind when comparing this chart. Now let's kick it into gear with F1 2020. Now I'm gonna be using the ultra high preset here and sure enough, each of the graphics cards is able to manage playable frame rates even on the minimum reported frame rate. The RX 580 again hits the bottom spot here, which is quite troubling considering we had held it in such high regard with our $600 budget build video, but we do see consistent scaling as we go up to the RTX 2080 Super. Now going from the RTX 2080 Super all the way to the RTX 3070, we see a massive performance improvement. So I'm really interested to see if the RTX 3060 Ti would be kind of in the middle there, right around 180 FPS, or if there's some other thing going on. Uh, you know, however you wanna cut it though, 1080p is no problem for any of these graphics cards. But when we go to 1440p, we do see a sizable reduction in frame rate, but the trend still applies, with the RX 580 almost able to get 60 FPS, but we are only able to get 120 Hertz displays running at full throttle with the RTX 2080 Super. Again, RTX 3070 and all of the other high tier GPUs managed to hit above 144 Hertz. Call of Duty Modern Warfare, this is being benchmarked inside of the single player campaign, so take that for what it's worth. However, we are able to hit with our 5900X uh, above 60 FPS on all the different graphics cards here. And what I really like here is the 5600 XT is able to hit 122 FPS, which is able to hit those 120 Hertz panels at uh, 1080p, which is really nice. Similar story can be said with 1440p, but in order to get 60 FPS with this particular uh, resolution, you are gonna need a GTX 1080 or higher. Assassin's Creed Valhalla is one of our first showcases of a quote, next gen game or current gen, depending on when you're looking at this game. And unfortunately, all of our low tier graphics cards are not able to play at 1080p high, but once you get to the GTX 1080 and higher, you are able to hit pretty playable frame rates across the board. But this is a slower paced game, so FPS isn't that critical at this point. Going up to 1440p though, we do require up to an RTX 2080 Super or better in order to manage 60 FPS gameplay with the high detail preset. Now this is one of those instances where we did start to see some of the smaller uh, VRAM allocations start to struggle from a frame rate perspective. All right, Doom Eternal Ultra Nightmare, it definitely needs more than four gigabytes of VRAM in order to be playable. And sure enough, the 1650 Super and the 5500 XT four gigabyte, they are unable to play this game at the setting. The RX 580 does manage, however, to get 92 FPS, which is pretty great. You know, this game is pretty easy to play at the onset, but this particular preset of Ultra Nightmare, it just takes much more VRAM than what some of these lower end cards have. And as we go up to 1440p, this just showcases again that six gigabytes is not enough to cover some of these games. The RX 580 is able to manage over 60 FPS play, uh, gameplay, and even our GTX 1080 plays really well at uh, 117 FPS. Now, keep in mind, I will not be including this game in the average gameplay results because since yeah, three of the nine graphics cards are not able to play the game, so take that for what it's worth. I've always been envious of playing Crisis with all settings set to the max, 
And for our testing today, we're only going to be using Crysis with the high setting at 1080p. And if you're wanting to get that 60 FPS threshold, you're going to have to go with the 5500 XT or higher, which unfortunately for the RX 580, you know, it's going to put it at the bottom of the stack when it comes to gameplay. Now we do start to see some stair stepping when it comes to the FPS going forward with the RTX 2080 Super matching the RTX 3070 and the RTX 3080 matching the 6900 XT. Going up to 1440p, however, it does provide some linear scaling as you go up from the 5600 XT all the way to the 6900 XT. Unfortunately though, the 580 and all of the other uh, entry level graphics cards, they are not able to hit 60 FPS. Cyberpunk 2077, another modern title that shows that you are going to need some sufficient horsepower to get 60 FPS, even at 1080p and high settings. Now, this is where I think the RTX 3060, the 3060 Ti, maybe even the RX 6700 XT, I think that those graphics cards would fit pretty well between the 5600 XT and the 2080 Super, but anything below that is going to be probably not, quote, playable at uh, less than 60 FPS here. Going to 1440p, that's going to be even harder for graphics cards to play, and you're going to be requiring up to an RTX 3070 or higher in order to get 60 FPS. Now, this is not including ray tracing, and it is not including DLSS, so this is just raw standard rasterization. As we saw with our Gears 5 benchmark video, we do see pretty decent GPU scaling as we go from the low tier graphics cards up to the mid tier graphics cards, and we actually see the 5600 XT surpass the 2080 Super here. And again, we see that big gap between the mid-range cars and the high-range cards, suggesting that an RTX 3060 Ti or the 6700 XT, 6800, those would fit well here. But once we go up to 1440p with Gears 5, we do see that you're going to need a pretty substantial card in order to get 60 FPS gameplay, and that would include anything faster than a 5600 XT. Again, we do see a sizable performance gap between the RTX 2080 Super and the RTX 3070. Metro Exodus is heavy on the, on the frame rate, and we see all of the low tier graphics cards unable to hit 60 FPS even at the high detail setting. The RX 5600 XT and the GTX 1080 do manage to hit 60 FPS, while we do start to see that the 3080 and 6900 XT appear to be hitting some sort of a bottleneck going forward. At 1440p, however, we do see that you're going to need a pretty beefy graphics card to hit 60 FPS, and our RTX 2080 Super manages to do just that. Unfortunately, the GTX 1080 and 5600 XT, they fall short by just a bit, so maybe adjusting quality settings will get you past that threshold. Now, I wanted to include the Crytek Neon Noir benchmark because I think that it is a good representation of a, a more hardware agnostic approach towards ray tracing. And what I like to see here is that cards above the RX 5600 XT, they do manage to get above 60 FPS in this particular benchmark, and we do see some pretty decent GPU scaling as we go up above the 5600 XT. But once we get to the 1440p, we do see that, again, the RTX 2080 Super and higher only managed to get above 60 FPS, and I would even suggest that the 2080 Super might just barely get to that threshold with this particular benchmark. Horizon Zero Dawn shows some pretty classic stair-stepping, again, with all of our low-tier graphics cards failing to hit the 60 FPS threshold with the ultimate quality preset. GTX 1080s and higher can hit the 60 FPS threshold, but if you're wanting to get 120 FPS in this particular title, you're going to need some pretty heavy horsepower. That's the RTX 3070 or higher. At 1440p, that adds insult to injury, but fortunately the 5600 XT and the GTX 1080, they do manage to hit 60 FPS in the built-in benchmark. Hitman 3, all the cards tested today are able to hit 60 FPS at 1080p with pretty good margin to spare. Once we go up to 1440p though, we do require at least the GTX 1080 and higher in order to hit those thresholds. Now these past two games, I was not able to test the 6900 XT, so I will not be including these two games in the average frame rate calculations. But Turk, what about 4K? 4K has been a hot topic from all the different marketing material I've seen on the internet, but it's unfortunately just hasn't been catching on when it comes to the consumers. According to the latest Steam Hardware survey, it's actually 1440p that appears to be the up and coming resolution for many gamers out there. 
Also, many of the cards that we have on our tier list today, they're just not capable of playing 4K gameplay at high frame rates. So if 4K is of interest to you, I highly recommend the upper mid tier or better, which would be RTX 2080 Supers or better. But Turk, you didn't include Fortnite, Rainbow Six Siege, or Valorant. Esports are a hugely popular segment in the industry, and fortunately for us, many of them are relatively lightweight and easy to play in the grand scheme of things. Now, if you want to look at what the frame rates look like for some lower end budget graphics cards, I highly recommend you check out my $600 budget build from uh, last year, and that'll give you a feel for what the RX 580, the 1650 Super, as well as the GTX 1080 play in those particular games. However, if you're looking for the highest frame rates possible at 1080p, I suggest picking up a GTX 1080 or better graphics card in order to get the best frames possible. All right, so let's actually calculate the average frame rates for all of the different graphics cards across the different games. Now again, I have to exclude some of the games that aren't able to hit the particular settings that I use for my GPU benchmarking. And that's gonna end us up with only nine games in our average gameplay here. As expected, at 1080p, each of the low tier cards is unable to hit 60 FPS in our forward looking games, suggesting that these cards, they need to run at lower detail resolutions or settings to be playable. Bumping up to the mid range and higher, we do surpass that 60 FPS breakpoint. But if 120 Hz gameplay is required, the high end is where you need to be shopping for a GPU. 1440p, it's an interesting twist with the low end starting to shift their marketing to a quote, more cinematic gameplay loop. The mid-range cards start to slip to right around 60 FPS, which suggests that you do need to dial back settings in order to keep frame rates consistent. Also, each of these tiers shows signs that larger frame buffers are needed for gaming. So if this is your budget tier, look for cards with eight gigabytes or more. Upper mid-tier cards also start to lose their luster a bit here with sub 120 hertz gameplay with reduced settings. However, as expected, the high-end cards easily hit that breakpoint without compromise. Keep in mind though, that if you need the extra frame rate and are in a GPU bound scenario, Nvidia's DLSS and AMD's Fidelity Super Resolution might get you past that breakpoint if your game supports it. But as we saw in our Warzone DLSS deep dive, DLSS won't save you in all instances. All right, let's talk brass tacks and talk a bit about money. As I mentioned earlier, pricing is all over the place. And when it comes to eBay, we have to deal with the likes of scalpers as well as those that are eager to offload their new egg shuffles that they just picked up in order to get the card they were really looking for. However, availability is practically non-existent on any of the other e-tailers out there. So for our analysis today, we have to look at eBay pricing. Now, what I did was for each of the graphics cards I've tested today, I've taken 20 of the latest completed and sold graphics cards as listed on eBay and averaged it out for that particular price. At 1080p, it should come as no surprise that each of our low tier GPUs win in terms of value. However, there are a couple things here to notice. First, the RX 580 is shockingly expensive given the frames it's able to produce. This is highly likely due to its ability to mine effectively for Ethereum. On the other hand though, the GTX 1080 is surprisingly cheap and it even beats its direct competitor, the RX 5600 XT by 14%. As for the high-end GPUs, we see the usual suspects falling in order, but that RTX 3080 it is extremely overpriced due to its sheer horsepower when it comes to crypto mining. If AMD's Fidelity Super Resolution performs as well as we're hyping it up to be, it might be a great time to hop on Team Red for your high-end gaming experience. At 1440p, we see the same GPU order as before, but we start to see stair-stepping as we go up the tier list. Again, the GTX 1080 performs very well here, but the mid-range cards do seem to slip up quite a bit in terms of value. What's interesting here is that the high end is, again, very competitive, showing that the market has recognized their performance at this resolution and scaled their price accordingly. However, the RTX 3080, it is still overpriced over on eBay. All right, guys, this is the last chart. Let's look at the raw average frame rate at both of the different resolutions and compare it against the MSRP price and the eBay listed price. Here in orange and blue, we see the MSRP of the cards versus their average frame rate. And it's great to see that as we double the frame rate, we expect to pay double the cost on the move from the low to the mid range. 
However, the move from 1080p to 140 FPS in the mid-range will cost you just about $300 at 1080p. That extra 30 FPS at the top end is going to cost you another $300 US. And at 1440p, we see similar scales and slopes, but starting at a much lower th FPS threshold. And there's eBay. Yellow is 1080p, gray is 1440p. Across the board, it costs nearly double just to get the cards that you were looking for. But let's say you're planning on making the move from 60 FPS to 120 FPS at 1080p. Expect to pay about $700 extra for that luxury. That same upgrade at 1440p, oh my goodness, it costs well over 1100 bucks. Now, however, this is eBay and prices are subject to change at the blink of an eye. If the crypto bubble happens to burst between now and the time you're watching this video, prices will likely drop quite a bit. However, you can expect the prices to be anywhere between the yellow and the orange lines for 1080p and gray and blue for 1440p. And the, I don't expect the prices to go any lower because at that point, the people selling the cards wouldn't be making any money, right? However you guys want to spin it, that is the GPU tier list as looked at on my AMD test rig. Let me know down in the comments if you guys think I've missed anything. Should I include 4K in my results or were my games a little bit too pessimistic or not covering enough of the eSports stuff? Don't be shy guys, drop a note down below. And these charts are always available to our Discord members probably days if not weeks before I get the videos out there. So if y'all want to get sneak peeks into the content we're making here on the channel, hop on into the TurkForce Discord. As always, if you guys want to reach out to me directly, you can hit me up over on Twitter at the Turk. Thanks again for watching the video, guys. I hope you all have a great day. We'll catch you in the next one.